the SK model. Well, thank you all for being here so late. I'm not that local, from two floors above, you know. So, <laughs> um, so well, but, but this talks about the SK model, but not necessarily about the, the things that you heard about this morning that might have heard about from the works of Talagran and Panchenko, so bear with me for a little bit. Um, so, well, okay, so the SK model is just this very simple, well, simple looking thing here. We have a state of spins, so we have n, uh, n particles, say they have a state that's either plus one or minus one, so that's like a discrete hypercube. Uh, we have these random variables which are ID standard Gaussian, and we consider this Hamiltonian, we can just say a function defined over this space, which is, well, the sum of sigma i, sigma j multiplied by these weights, which are Gaussian and random. Right? So, okay, it's a random Hamiltonian, but maybe for today's talk, the way we're going to think about this is uh, as just a very simple example of a random function. And we want to understand properties of this random function, right? So the physics part of the SK model is not going to play a role here. Uh, right, so the, the, as I said, right, we want to understand this function. And there's a very celebrated result by Talagran confirming a formula that was put forward in the physics literature by Giorgio Parisi, which says the following. So if you take you compute the minimum of this function on, of the, on the hypercube of size n, right? The minimum over sigma. And uh, you divide that by n to the three halves, and uh, you, well, you put a minus because you want to have a positive number. When n goes to infinity, so the more and more spins you have, you're going to get this closer and closer to a constant. Well, this converges actually, I mean, the sense of expectations, but also more truly. And this constant is positive, and it's given by a very complicated formula called the Parisi formula. That, that was the main result by Talagran. Uh, well, since that paper, which is maybe from 10 or 12 years ago, there have been a lot of progress and properties of the Gibbs measure given by this Hamiltonian. But as I said, we're not going to be talking too much about this. There's a, well, there's a very nice book by Panchenko about this sort of problem. There have been many, many more develops since his book has been written, which wasn't so long ago. But anyway. So our problem today is to understand local minimum of this random function. What's the local minimum? So we're just going to stick with the simplest possible definition. So sigma, maybe I should just write it, this here. Sigma, as I said, is just a configuration, right? So it's just a, a vector of plus and minus ones. And uh, we say that this sigma i here is what you would obtain if you take sigma and we keep all coordinates except that we flip the ith coordinate, right? So if the ith coordinate of 1, we flip it to minus 1 and vice versa. And the local minimum, by definition, is a configuration of spins uh, whose neighbors, right? So such that any, any other configuration that you can obtain by flipping one single site has larger energy than sigma itself. And, uh, okay, this is the function again. And our questions are, I mean, the questions we're going to answer are very simple. We're just going to understand how many local minima there are and what's the typical energy of a local minimum. Right? So, okay, why would you want to answer this question? I mean, this is not necessarily the, uh, the first question that comes to people's minds. I mean, it's, uh, it's apparently one of the last since people have been working on this for a, for a while now. And, uh, well, so the, the way we think about it is that we want to gain some insight on this random function, right? So it's... Uh, uh, we want to understand what this, well, we could call it an energy landscape, I guess, looks like, right? And this seems like an obvious enough question that hadn't been explored. It will turn out to be the case that most local minima have similar depth in the sense that there's a, a constant, a fixed constant such that essentially all local minima lie within a very small band of this value. And uh, the other question, uh, the other reason why you might want to be interested in local minima is that it turns out that by a recent paper by Omar Angel, Seb Bubek, uh, Yuval Perez, and uh, Yufei Wei, uh, you can find these local minimum polynomial time but ju just by a greedy algorithm, right? Whereby, well, you take your current configuration, you look, you look into whether there's a coordinate that's going to decrease your energy value. If there is such a coordinate, you just flip it, and you keep doing that. What they proved is that in polynomial time, maybe n raised to the 11, or something like that, uh, this a process would stop with a, with a local minimum. And uh, it's an interesting question to understand how such local minimum compared to the global minimum given by the Parisi formula. Well, there's a caveat here which you can't really address at the point, which is 
that these local minima are not necessarily the ones that the, uh, our local minima are not necessarily the ones that the algorithm finds, right? So uh, the local minima that the algorithm finds are not necessarily uniform of all local minima or anything like that. But in any case, I mean, it's, uh, it seems interesting to the same local minima, right? Okay, so what are the results? First result is that we can compute uh, the expected number of local minima up to exponential order in this sense, right? So the expected number is 2 to the, some constant alpha times n plus a smaller order terms in the exponent. And this alpha uh, is given by some simple variational principle coming from some large deviations function that I'm going to describe towards the end of the talk. Second is, okay, this is a bit harder to read, uh, but it's saying this. So take any configuration spins and condition on it being a local minimum. Right? What's the conditional distribution of this energy here? And here I'm normalizing by n to the minus 3 halves, so, which is the, the same order of magnitude of the, the Parisian uh, minimum. Right? And it turns out that this quantity here behaves in a very non-random manner in the sense that it's very concentrated around a, a value here, uh, nu star, minus nu star, right? up to lower order terms. Well, in this precise sense here, if you condition on having a local minimum, and you look at this energy, and you, oh, you, you look at the difference between that and minus nu star, the probability that this is large is exponentially small. Okay. This also comes from a variational formula. We're going to see the formula at the end if you're curious. I mean, but maybe the most interesting thing is just to see where this comes from, because it's very simple and very, well, once you decide what to do, right? When you choose this problem to solve. Uh, OK, so what's the proof like, right? So, Clearly, we have to worry about these quantities here, which is uh, how much uh, the Hamiltonian increases when you flip i, right? Or it could decrease as well. But of course, since we're worried about local minimum, we want this to be larger than 0. And in fact, if you look at these random variables, I mean, each one of them individually, I'm dividing by half just for convenience. Each one of them individually, OK, this is sort of unfortunate because I have n and n here. Each one of them is a normal random variable with mean 0 and variance n minus 1. And uh, well, the property that sigma is a local minimum is precisely the property that all these variables are positive. And uh, OK, and this is a random vector, right? x1 up to xn. What's the distribution on this random vector? Well, it's Gaussian. So we just need to compute the covariance matrix. And this is what it, it looks like. It has n minus 1 on the diagonal, which comes from this. It has this one terms off the diagonal, which just means that if I look at xi, x sub i, and x sub k, there's one term of which they overlap, and all the other terms are independent. Okay, so it's very simple. And since it's very simple, you can try your hand at, at computing this probability that sigma is a local minimum explicitly, right? The event is here, and you just want to compute the probability of this event under some high dimensional Gaussian measure. The covariance matrix is simple, is a rank one perturbation of a multiple of the identity. So, well, the formula would be this, right, if sigma n is the covariance matrix. And it turns out by doing lots of changes of variables, you get a, an explicit formula in terms of a standard normal random vector in n dimensions. So this guy here is a random vector with iid standard normal coordinates in Rn. And the probability of the event that we're looking at is just this number here. Right? So basically, we have to evaluate this expectation in order to compute the expected number of local minima. Right? Because this is the probability that individual configuration is a local minimum. Just take 2 times n, 2 to the n times this, and that's the expected number. Right, so, <clears throat> okay, this is just saying, okay, the asymptotics of the log of the expectation are just the asymptotics of the log of this expectation over here. Uh, well, we know how to compute this expectation. Basically, we can write it explicitly. We get something like this. We get this, this is a, look, this is a, yeah, I'm not sure if I emphasize this, this is the L1 norm of a vector, right? So it's not the Euclidean norm, which is easier to understand. It's the L1 norm. And this L1 norm, well, you can compute its expectation, you can compute its variance, and it turns out to have uh, fluctuations of an order that requires that you analyze this integral here uh, using large deviation techniques. Okay? It could be that somehow the, the fluctuations of this quantity here, the exponent, were negligible, and we could just replace what's inside with an expectation. That's not the case, so it, we get something that, uh, that you can address using, say, some version of Verdun's uh, 
uh, lemma in the large deviation theory to get the sharp constant. But it's also not hard to use the log sub 11 equality to analyze this and get, for instance, that this expectation, well, the log of it divided by n, is between these two constants, right? So the actual value comes from a formula that I'm going to show in the end. Right, so, okay, so this is question number one, right? It's about the, the expected number of local minima. What about the this energy distribution when you condition a configuration of being a local minimum? So, okay, so we had these variables x sub i, and uh, I mean, the event of a, a sigma being a local minimum, as I said before, is just the event that they're all positive. But it turns out that we can also write the Hamiltonian in terms of these guys. Because you see, I, here I just have sigma i, sigma j, w i, j for a fixed i, right? So if I sum these guys, we'll normalize properly to get the same normalization I had before. I have this sum. And uh, yeah, and then you can write, okay, the event that the, the energy of the Hamiltonian minus it, divided by the answer to three halves is larger than, than uh, delta, is just this other event here. So again, it's an event involving the same random variables that I had before, right? So these are Gaussians with the specific covariance structure. Okay, so what comes out of this? Well, what comes out is that you can write down this conditional probability as another kind of integral where somehow large deviations are going to play a role, right? So I have here the expectation that I had before. This is just a probability that sigma is a local minimum. And on the numerator, I have this exponential integral multiplied by an, ind by an indicator here that concerns the L1 norm of uh, this Gaussian random vector. Right now, it's a standard Gaussian, as I told you before. So it's, well, again, once you set your mind on this, it's not that difficult to work it out. If you know the tools we use, like uh, things like Perdon's Lemma, we can write down the Laplace transform for this guy explicitly, well, more or less explicitly. So it's, uh, it's all good. Right, so OK, I've been telling you about these formulas, and I haven't really said what they are, right? So what, what are the formulas like? Well, I said they are variational formulas because they come from large deviation kinds of things. But here is sort of the, it turns out that all of them are kind of, I wouldn't say they're quite explicit, but they're, we can write it down in, in a form that doesn't involve a variational formula. There's just some, some equations for them, right? So OK, this is just a cumulative distribution function on the normal random variable. This is the log of twice this thing. Now for each x, I can compute this value lambda star of x, the unique lambda for which that solves this equation. We have to prove that it exists, but it's not hard. And now you have this new star, which is the unique new for which new equals twice lambda star of this same new. So it's a kind of fixed point equation for new. Once you get this guy, and this is going to be exactly the, the energy of a local minimum, right? Up to normalization sign. And up, once you have this guy, you can compute this, the alpha. And alpha, remember, it's just the exponent in the formula for the expected number of local minimum. And I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm showing these formulas just because I guess I have to. But uh, the, the important thing is that it essentially all come from the, from the large deviations principle for the L1 norm of a standard Gaussian random vector in high dimensions, right? So you have to work with it a little bit. I mean, the, and the nice thing is that these are all one-dimensional problems, so we can do numerics with these things. OK, what, what kind of numerical question would you want to answer with this? Well, OK, here's one natural question. We have this local minimum value, right? So if you have a local minimum, its energy divided by n to the 3 halves should be close to minus this. And of course, we have the global minimum, which is given by the Parisi formula. Right? So you can ask, as I asked before, right? So uh, how close are local minima to global minima? And uh, well, I, I wrote these numbers down, and maybe I shouldn't have, because we're a bit, uh, we still not quite, aren't quite sure about the numerics here. So there are things we need to check. But it looks like from our preliminary studies that they're actually the value is surprisingly close to Parisi, right? So we're, OK, it's good up to one decimal digit, if you want to put it that way. Right. So it seems interesting that somehow requiring something much weaker than having a global minimum still gives you a similar energy value. Right? But perhaps more interesting is asking questions that are related to this 
and take you towards the, the full Parisi solution. And uh, okay, so there, these are the open problems, and I guess it's going to be quite quick, right? So the first open problem is that we only have bounds for the expected number of local minima. We have no idea what th those values are typical. Or somehow, you know, it's only an expectation. What can we say about the actual value? In principle, it's just a second moment calculation, but if you look at it, you're going to be as scared as we were. Or maybe not, and then you can solve the problem. Uh, right, so we get we want, another question that I think is very interesting is we want to relate these local minima that we find, right? So, so I mean, we condition a configuration being a local minimum. What about these uh, local minima that this greedy algorithm finds? What can we say about them? Are they the same somehow? Or are they different? We, at, the, at this point, we don't really know much. But this is like the problem that I like the most here. And uh, you can, uh, we looked at a very simple definition of what a local minimum is, right? So we're just saying, well, a configuration is a local minimum if by flipping any single spin, I don't decrease its energy. So what about if you allow for uh, flipping k spins? That would be a k local minimum by definition. And the question is, is it true? Okay, here's a, Here's a kind of, this is a kind of very bold conjecture that's implicit here. It's saying, okay, if you take k large enough, this should get closer and closer to the Parisi solution, right? Okay, so the, the bold conjecture, I guess, is saying that k is a constant. Of course, finding the right k for which this thing goes to zero would be a very interesting challenge to see how, I mean, how large k needs to be in order to approach the, the, the true global max, the minimum, sorry. And, of course, there's a minus sign missing here. And, well, that's it. Thank you very much.